Chapter Twenty Four of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of Frisco. It was not until Herrick was well on his way back to the center of the town that he remembered his omission to ask Robin about the typewritten letter. But after all, it did not matter. He knew perfectly well that Joyce had typed it at his father's dictation, and the denial or admission of the little man would make no difference. Things had got past that point. I must see Belcher and Kidd, said Herrick to himself, and learn exactly how Santiago managed the business. Then I'll give Firth a look in. I must find some way of speaking to Frisco. Now that he is driven into a corner, he may tell the truth, that is, if it is not likely to hang him. When he arrived at the Strand office of the private inquiry firm, he was received by Kidd. Belcher, it appeared, had gone out for the day on business. Kidd was a heavy man with a red face and a pair of leering gray eyes. Dr. Jim could put up with the ferret, but Kidd he detested. However, as Kidd was the only representative of the firm present, he tackled him, and with no light hand, for Jim was in a royal rage at the way he had been tricked by this cunning pair of rascals. "'What is this I hear about the arrest of the man Frisco?' he asked. "'Just this, doctor,' replied Kidd, in his heavy voice, but civilly enough. Don Manuel Santiago gave Belcher the tip on how Frisco could be trapped, and as me and him wanted to earn the reward, we fixed the matter up. Against my wish, retorted Dr. Jim, did I not say that you were not to meddle in the matter? And why shouldn't we get the reward if we could, sir? I had my own reasons that Frisco should be left at large. You have spoiled a plan of mine, and likely as not have caught the wrong man. As to that, sir, said Kidd doggedly, I don't know. But right or wrong, we've caught the man and claim the reward. It is offered by Mr. Stephen Marsh Carr, said Herrick coolly, and the matter is in my hands. It is just as likely as not that I may stop Mr. Marsh Carr from paying you one penny. You had better have done my business properly, Kid. We did do it properly, said Kid in a surly tone. I don't think so. It was my wish that the Mexican should be watched. You have let him leave the country. I didn't, protested Kid, who would have been insolent, but that he was afraid of losing the reward. That was Belcher's game. Belcher's price for receiving instructions how to trap Frisco, scoffed Herrick. Do you think I don't know that Santiago taught the cipher to your damned partner? You might be civil, Dr. Herrick. I shall be what I please. You are engaged by me to do certain business and you have done it badly. Had I wanted Frisco caught, I should have told you. Now, just you let me know how it all came about. What about the reward, sir? I'll see to that, you fools, to go against me like this. I can do your business considerable damage by telling the way you have tricked me. Oh, sir, you won't do that, growled Kid, now thoroughly frightened. It all depends on how you conduct yourself. The harm is done, but I must know how Santiago managed the business. It was this way, sir, replied the cowed kid. Belcher watched the foreign cove, sir, and kept out of sight. But the Don knew him from going to the gambling club. Ah, that's another matter. I can spoil for you, kid. I know too much of your shady business for you to play the fool with me. Go on, man. It took Kid all he knew to keep his temper under this speech. But he knew that Dr. Herrick would do what he had threatened if he was not implicitly obeyed. Had Jim been a smaller man, Kid might have tried conclusion with his fists. But he knew Herrick too well to attempt such folly. Once upon a time, Kid had seen the doctor thrash a larger and much heavier man. From that day, he resolved never to have a fight with a man so versed in the noble art as this high-tempered gentleman. 
Well, sir, he continued in a sulky growl, it was this way. Santiago spotted Belcher and asked him what he was up to. Belcher would not tell, but in the end, the Don got the truth out of him. Then he said that if Belcher and me could catch Frisco, we could get a bigger sum of money than by watching him. Belcher was always anxious to know what was at the back of all this. When he heard it was the car murder case, he saw that it was a big thing for him and me. So he said he would let the Don go if he helped him to catch Frisco. Then the Don showed us the cipher. He wrote it out himself and put it in the newspaper. Frisco came to the place, and me and Belcher had a detective and a warrant. We caught him easy. He's now in quotes, sir. And Santiago is on the high seas on his way to Mexico. You are a precious pair of scoundrels, kid. Why did you tell Mr. Joyce that I had managed all this business? It was the Don as asked us to do that, sir. To make trouble, I suppose, said Herrick, rising. You send Belcher to see me at the Gulaf Hotel this evening. I have something to say to him. Take care, sir. The ferret ain't an easy man to tackle. Herrick paused at the door and looked the big man up and down. Confound your insolence, he said. Do you think you or that rat can stand up against me? I can ruin both of you if I choose and stop you getting that reward. As for Belcher, if he is impudent, I'll wring his neck. I'm sorry we did it, sir. You may well be, was Herrick's grim reply. But I ain't going to be bullied by anyone, said Kidd, with sudden anger. That is quite enough, my man, replied Dr. Jim, opening the door and speaking quietly. If you try that game, you'll get the worst of it. Kidd looked dangerous for a moment, but after a glance into the eyes of his proposed antagonist, he cooled down considerably. He knew perfectly well that Herrick could smash him. Moreover, the calm courage of Herrick quelled his brute passion. Dr. Jim waited for a time, then departed, leaving Kidd growling and cursing in impotent rage. A dangerous ruffian, thought Herrick, as he went into the Strand. But I think he and Belcher know me too well to play the fool. For the moment he intended to go back to the Gulaf Hotel and see Stephen, but on reflection he drove to the solicitors. It was necessary that he should interview Frisco, and Firth would be the man most likely to obtain for him the permission to do so. The lawyer was in, and expressed his pleasure at the capture of Colonel Carr's assassin. As to that, I am not certain, said Herrick lightly. I want to hear what he has to say, Firth, and you must get me permission to see the man. Don't you think he killed Carr? asked Firth. On the face of it, I do, replied Herrick. All the same, there have been so many surprises in this case that I am prepared for more. Besides, I am rather mad over the business. And he told Firth how he had been tricked by Belcher and his partner. couple of scoundrels, said Firth, nodding. It's not the first dirty trick they have played. Don't you engage them again, Dr. Herrick. I'll find men who are more to be trusted. I hope to heaven that I won't have occasion to employ any more private detectives. I tell you what, Firth, ever since I have engaged in this affair, I feel as though I had been bathing in dirty water. But that I promised Mrs. Marsh to protect her son, I should not have done it. You seem to have gone pretty exhaustively into the business, said Firth, after he had heard the whole story. For an amateur, you have managed remarkably well. Herrick laughed. I have made mistakes, I admit, but then, as you say, I am only an amateur and not the detective of fiction. He never makes mistakes. I wish he had had this case to deal with. However, the thing is nearly at an end, thank goodness. It will end with the hanging of Frisco. Who knows? He may have some other story to tell. You may be sure he will swear that he is innocent, said Firth. Very likely, responded Herrick. And the queer thing is, Firth, that he may really be innocent. It looks to me, from what you have told me, 
as though he were guilty. Oh, as to that, I've thought several people guilty, and have always found out that I am wrong, when they came to explain. However, I want to see this man and hear what he has to say. Can you manage it? I'll see what I can do. You are at the Guluf Hotel, ain't you? Well, good. I'll see to it. I might come along and call on Marsh Carr. I should if I were you, replied Dr. Jim with a laugh. Always be attentive to your clients, Firth. Leaving the solicitor to arrange matters, Herrick went back to the hotel and dinner with Stephen. He told him all that he had done, and the squire was much interested. I hope it is coming to an end, though, he said. I've had about enough of this sort of thing. Think of me, said Jim with a shrug. Oh, you've behaved like a brick, Jim. I do not know how to thank you. Bosh, my dear chap, there's no question of thanks between you and myself. I promised your mother to see you through, and I intend to keep my word. And you won't let me make things right for you, grumbled Stephen. Wait till everything is squared up, then we will see. I may ask you to be my banker after all. Well, Steve, Santiago has gone away, so you are relieved of at least one of your enemies. Joyce can do nothing without his father, and that gentleman is in jail. Will you want me to go with you tomorrow? No, I prefer to see him alone. I'll get more out of him in that way. I wonder what I'll hear this time. However, let us think no more of the matter just now. We might take a turn down to see the Earl's Court's exhibition. There's always something going on there. It's not exactly like a theater, Steve, or I should not ask you to go. But you must be cheered up somehow. We can't stay in this dismal hotel all evening talking about a criminal. Stephen assented, as he always did to whatever Herrick proposed. They went to the exhibition and spent a pleasant evening. When they returned, Dr. Jim retired straightway to bed. I shall have a lot of talking to do tomorrow, so I must get as much rest as I possibly can, said he. In some mysterious way, Firth obtained the required permission, and Herrick found himself introduced into a small cell where Frisco sat on his bed in a gloomy frame of mind. After exchanging a few words with the warder, Firth got the man to go away, leaving Herrick and Frisco alone. So, you are Dr. Herrick, remarked Frisco calmly. I'm glad to meet you. He spoke in a rather refined voice, and did not at all look like the truculent ruffian Herrick had expected to meet. He was no longer fat, but had quite a shapely figure. Also his face had lost the redness of incessant drinking. Misfortune had sobered and improved the man. He was plainly dressed in a suit of dark serge, which, as he afterwards informed Herrick, had been supplied by his son. But even if he had been still more changed, Dr. Jim would have recognized him from the criss-cross scar on his forehead. Frisco saw him looking at it and smiled. The colonel's handiwork, he said quietly. He marked me with a buoy in Los Angeles one drunken evening. But I gave him as good as he gave me, Dr. Herrick. He lost a finger. And Frisco fell to whistling at the pleasing recollection. There was no doubt about the man being a scoundrel. Herrick felt his way carefully. How did you know me? he asked abruptly. Frisco smiled. I heard the man who came with you call you by your name. As for the rest, of course Robin has told me all about you. You are a clever man, Dr. Herrick, and I think a kind one. If you had not been, you would not have burdened yourself with that miserable rat I have the misfortune to call my son. All the same, added Frisco with a scowl, you trapped me in a rather shabby way. Ah, that is one reason why I came to see you, said Herrick, coolly. I did not trap you at all. No one was more surprised than I at the news of your arrest. It was Santiago who put that cipher in the paper and told the police about you. 
and Santiago is beyond your reach on the high seas. So you see that I am not so mean as you thought me. That's it, said Frisco. You always fought fair, and I could not understand you playing low down like this. So it was the greaser, was it? By heaven, when I catch him. Frisco doubled his arm. It's time he was out of the world, said Frisco. A beating's too easy. I'll go west for him. How do you mean you'll go west? asked Herrick, thinking of the man's position, which was, apparently, considerably within the shadow of the gallows. Frisco looked at him with a careless laugh. He understood. Oh, I've been in worse holes than this, he said. Why, once in California, the rope was round my neck for horse-stealing. Carr got me out of that mess. You are a great friend of Carr's? Why, said the man slowly, he was my cousin, you know, and we had the same blood in us, the bad Carr blood. How I ever came to have such a brat of a Methodist parson for a son, I can't make out. Got it from his mother, I suppose. She was always a whimpering devil. I didn't come here to discuss your son and wife, Joyce. Frisco's my name for the time being, said the man coolly. When I get across the pond again, I'll take a more Christian one. Hmm. You won't have an easy time getting out of this scrape. Well, no, you are about right there, Herrick. You don't mind me dropping the mister, I hope. I feel friendly to you. You are about the only man in the whole lot. Stephen isn't a bad chap, but if he hadn't had you beside him, I'd have got that money. Well, I'm to be tried for my life. What are you going to do, Herrick? Something quixotic, replied the doctor. Robin has no money, neither have you, so I'm going to supply you with a solicitor and see you through. If you are guilty, I wish to see you hanged. If innocent, free. All the same, said Herrick, frankly, I tell you candidly, Frisco, that I don't think it fair to hang you for the killing of a brute like Carr. Frisco stared at Dr. Jim in a hard, unwinking manner. But he was visibly moved. You're a white man, Doc, said he, and I'm a bad lot. All the same, if you don't mind, he held out his hand. I'll take that only on one condition, said Herrick, that you tell me you are innocent of murder. Frisco drew back his hand and recovered his hard manner. You bet I'm not, he said. That is where Carr had the pull over me. There are two towns in South America I daren't go near. He burst out laughing. So you won't shake hands, said he. Well, I don't blame you. I'm a bad lot, but Carr was a damn sight worse, Sonny. You can take that from me. We are wasting time, I think, said Herrick coldly. I want to help you if I can. You shall have a lawyer to defend you. But I want to ask you, as man to man, did you shoot Carr? Frisco thought for a moment, stroking his chin. Well, there's not many men I tell my mind to, but you are one. I did not kill Carr. Then who did? I'll tell you in a few minutes. But you let me reel out my yarn first. I know most of it from Robin and Santiago. You don't know all, replied Frisco quietly. I've been with Carr these twenty years and more. He was a devil and treated me like a dog. I helped him to get that treasure, and he cheated me of my share of it. I shouldn't think you were the man to be cheated. No, in an ordinary way, you bet. But the colonel had the bulge on me, I guess. He could have handed me over to the authorities in San Francisco for a murder. Oh, don't look scared, Herrick. I'm not going to own up to all my crimes. I have committed heaps, though. Oh, damn your beastly talk, said Herrick angrily, for the shamelessness of the man made him sick. Just tell me about that night. All in good time, Sonny, said the unmoved Frisco. I stayed with the colonel and let him keep my money because I did not want my wife to know I was alive. She was a good woman, and I treated her like a brute. That was one reason. The second was because of my own skin. 
I did not want to be hanged, and Carr could have hanged me any day. The third reason, and here Frisco looked curiously at Herrick, you'll hardly believe the third reason. But it was a kind of tenderness for Carr. Somehow, devil as he was, I liked him. Never met a man I cottoned to more. He saved my life, I saved his. We fought with knives and with fists, and played the devil with one another all around. Yet somehow we stuck together and never went back on one another. Rum thing, wasn't it, Herrick? Honor amongst thieves, said Dr. Jim with a shrug. You bet that's it, retorted Frisco. So you can see, Herrick, that I was not the sort of man to put Carr out of the way. I got drunk, so did he, but we held together in that blamed house, always waiting for death. Ah, the Indians, I suppose. Santiago told you that, I guess, said the man. Yes, there was some half Spanish, half Indian greasers in Lima that would have followed us to the end of the world had they spotted our whereabouts. Santiago was one, but he wished for the money on his own hook and didn't split. Well, Carr is dead, so he is safe enough. But if I'm not hanged, I guess Santiago will let out on me. Then I'll have a time getting away. Was it on account of this fear that Carr built a tower? Frisco nodded. You've hit it, queer chap, Carr. A mixture of bravado and fear. He threw down all the fences and walls and left the doors of the house open every night just to show he was not afraid. All the same, he never slept but in that tower. I didn't. If any of the greasers had come, they'd have knifed me easy enough. Well, Carr went under before his time, but by the hand he least expected. Who was it? asked Herrick impatiently. Well, drawled the ruffian, it wasn't Mrs. Marsh. We had a talk. I know all about that. I saw the letter you wrote her. Oh, you did? She kept that as an ace. Robin typed it on his blamed machine for me. I wanted to get the money quietly, but the old lady went under in time and spoiled my game there. She killed herself, said Herrick curtly. Did she now, said Frisco in admiration. She was a screamer of a woman, not like my wife. Killed herself. Lord, he chuckled. Go on with your story. It is a story, isn't it? Well, I guess it was this way. I let Carr keep the money, when he was alive, on the understanding that it was all left to me. He made a will in my favor, and then... The devil made a later one, giving the money to Stephen, with a reversion to me, if his bones weren't looked after. I know, said Herrick coolly, and you tried to have Stephen disabled. Right you are and the blame Santiago bungled the affair. If I had been on the spot, well, that's all done with, about the will. Mrs. Marsh came and kicked up a row about the will in favor of her son, saying the colonel was going to alter it. She picked up something of that from me when I had a cargo aboard, but I never knew to after she came how Carr was tricking me. When she went, and she did curse him. I had a row with Carr. He told me the kind of will he made. We almost had a stand-up fight. He brought in the murder business about me as usual, and I knuckled under as usual. Then I went off to drink rum at the Carr Arms. Yes, and to threaten the colonel. Oh, that wasn't on my own account. All I met was that if I gave the tip to the Lima greasers, Carr would be knifed. That fool napper thought I meant to do the job myself. Well, sir, I came back and lay down to sleep off the rum. Carr got his own dinner and then dressed himself up as he always did. Blamed foolishness, I always called it. Cooking your dinner and then wearing a starched shirt to eat it? Pa! Frisco spat. He wanted to keep his self-respect, I suppose. He had no occasion for an article of that sort, Herrick. Self-respect in Carr? Well, I should smile. However, I was asleep. When I was pulling round sober and thinking of getting up to eat, 
I heard a shot. Oh, I am too used to the sound of shooting not to know it when I hear it. I wondered if Carr was in the shooting gallery. After a time, twenty minutes maybe, I got up and went into the gallery. No one was there. I went up to the tower after visiting the dining room. I found the colonel dead. I was in a fright, I can tell you. In a flash, I saw that my neck was in the rope. I had threatened the colonel, and they'd think I killed him. Also, I was wanted in Frisco and South America and half a hundred places. My name would come out, maybe, but I'm not afraid of that now, Herrick, and I would be turned off as sure as a gun. I went downstairs and drank some wine in the house, and coming down from a room under the one in which Carr lay shot, I saw someone. As he came down the tower steps, it is my opinion, he shot the colonel. If it wasn't him, I don't know who could have done it. And who was it, you say? Why, don't jump, Herrick. It was Sidney Endicott. Herrick stared. That lad never killed the colonel, he said. Then who did, asked Frisco impatiently. That boy just hated Carr. I never could make out why, and he was half-witted besides. Then there was the pistol. I read about it in the paper. It's just the kind of weapon a boy of that sort might pick up cheap in a shop of sorts. A man like me would have used a derringer. No, I'm sure the boy shot him. He came right upon me, as cool as you like, and says, he's quite dead. Did he say that? I swear he did. He's quite dead, says Sidney. Then, before I could get my breath, he went out into the night and I lost him. Why did you not follow? I had to think of my own safety. It was no use my accusing a boy and a half-idiot, you see. No one would believe he killed Carr when I was in the house, and with my blamed past. I just went to the back to make up a bundle and clear out. While I was packing, I heard three shots and jumped for the door. Lord, I was in a fright. It was Mrs. Marsh. Yes, she came down looking like a tigress and said I'd killed Carr. I was at the door with my bundle. I denied it and said I'd make it hot for her. She said I'd better look after myself and cleared. I didn't wait, you may be sure, for in spite of her firing the shots, I didn't know but what she had roused the village. So I went straight across the moor and caught the train at Southbury. Here I've been hidden in London ever since. I had money. When that ran out, I dropped the cross at cipher in the paper and met my fool of a son. Then, well, you know the rest. It's a strange story, said Herrick, much distressed. It did not seem at all unlikely, but that Sidney had killed the colonel. It's a true one. Well, what are you going to do? I shall see this boy and find out if what you say is true. Oh, I expect he's such an idiot that he'll think he's done something fine and own up. But that my neck is in danger, I would not split on Sidney. But they'll only shut him up in an asylum. They would hang me, so of two evils I choose the least. Are you off, Herrick? Yes. I'll see if this is true and get you a lawyer. Thanks, old man. You're a good sort. So long. And Frisco, quite calm, waved his hand as Dr. Jim left the cell. He did not seem to be in the least afraid and evidently thought his release was a foregone conclusion. A dangerous, cool-headed ruffian was Frisco. End of chapter 24「Chapter Twenty Five of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sidney speaks out. After that interview with Frisco, Dr. Jim took Stephen straight off to Saxon. There was nothing left for him to do in town. Frisco was in prison and safe enough. Joyce shut himself up in his flat 
and would not even reply to the note Herrick wrote him. Belcher, for obvious reasons, had not called at the Gulup Hotel, and with his partner was keeping out of the doctor's way. Jim saw Firth for a few brief minutes, instructed him to see after the defense of Frisco, and then drove to Paddington, where Marsh Carr awaited him. By favor of the guard and five shillings, they secured a smoking carriage to themselves. When the train was fairly out of town, and whizzed through a desolate winter country, Dr. Herrick looked at Stephen. "'What do you think of it all?' he asked, lighting his pipe. "'This story of Frisco's? Yes, it's a living truth. I can see by your face that you wish to believe the man a liar. He is, but not in this instance. What he says is absolutely true. I saw his eyes when he spoke. The tongue may lie, but a man's eyes... Jim shook his head. But it can't be true, cried Stephen, looking white and worried. Good heavens, Jim, if Sidney really shot Carr, think of the disgrace to Ida and Bess. Ourselves, I don't mind that. But these poor girls. Well, said Jim, after a pause, you see, it's not so bad as it might be. I am sure you must know of the estimation Sidney is held in. Roundabout Saxon, if it comes out that he shot the colonel, no one will express any surprise. It's no slur on the girl, Steve. Sidney is looked upon as something beyond the pale of humanity. What will they do with him? asked Stephen anxiously. If he really did commit the crime, he will be placed in an asylum. The boy is too queer to be judged by ordinary standards. Frisco cleared out, although he knew Sidney had killed Carr, because he thought no one would believe the boy had done it. The suspicion certainly would have rested on Frisco. He would have been wiser to have given himself up. But for the reason I told you of, the same reason that kept him quiet under the Colonel's unjust appropriation of his property, Frisco preferred to cut. He is wiser now that he has had time to reflect over the matter. His devilries in the Americas were done under other names, and, as Joyce, he will not be wanted in San Francisco. I dare say, if he had not been caught, he would have given himself up in the long run. It was the Don he was afraid of. Now the Don is away, Frisco is convinced he will be set free. He must stand his trial. Certainly, I have told Firth to see after him. But his defense will be that Sidney killed the man. There is no way of averting that. The question in my mind, said Herrick, looking at Marsh Carr, is whether the boy really did so. Have you any doubt on the subject? asked Stephen eagerly. I have a great many doubts, replied Jim dryly, and until the person who really murdered Carr confesses, I shall continue to doubt. You see, Steve, ever since I took up this matter, I have been following up false trails. Every person I have stumbled upon, and to whose guilty evidence at the time procurable, pointed, has laid the blame on someone else, who in turn has passed on the guilt to another party. I suspected Joyce. He accused Santiago. The Don said Pentland Corn was guilty. Corn declared that Mrs. Marsh had fired the shot. Now we know from accurate evidence that all these persons are innocent. Frisco was suspected from the very first. He is caught and swears, truly enough according to his own belief, that the boy murdered the colonel. How do I know? but what Sidney may be able to prove his innocence and accuse someone else. The chain may go on endlessly, so far as I can see. I understand the difficulty, replied Stephen wearily, but I cannot for the life of me see why Sidney should kill the man. There comes in the queer character of the boy, said Herrick. He detested the colonel, said he was a bad man. He might have got into his head in some way or another, that such a man was better off out of the world. If so, he would make no more account of killing Carr than he would of putting a fly out of existence. Indeed, he would rather spare the fly, for I have noticed that he is tender to all that breathes. 
But would he keep quiet over the matter? I think so. Sidney was never the boy to talk. Then there is the pistol, Stephen. That is an old-fashioned weapon that a boy might buy in Beelminster for a few pence, or he might have found it in the lumber room of the Grange. There are many of these ancient firearms to be found in the houses of old families. If Sidney dropped across such a weapon, he might have then concluded to kill Carr. You see, from the account of Frisco, that he came down the tower stairs and said quite calmly that the colonel was dead. He may just as calmly admit to me or to you that he killed the man. Mad, mad, groaned Marsh Carr. He must be mad. No, that does not follow. The boy is strange. There are things about him which I cannot explain. So far as I can see, Sidney does not come within the range of science. That foretelling of your mother's death, his extraordinary statement that you were in danger, puzzled me beyond words. I must believe, because I am convinced by the evidence of my own senses. All the same, I cannot explain or understand. There are laws of nature with which we are unacquainted. I believe that this boy comes under some unknown laws. You cannot account for the action of such a person. The boy would do things which we should call wrong, yet he would see no harm in doing them. If he is guilty, he will be put away in an asylum. At the same time, I am sure he is perfectly sane. I am puzzled myself about him, admitted Stephen, and he is a most uncomfortable boy to have about one. Still, I have always found him upright and honorable. I have never known him to tell a lie. But he must know all about this case and how Frisco has been accused. I'm not so sure of that. Sidney lives with his head in the clouds. He perhaps has heard that Frisco has been accused, but as the man does not now come across his path, he never thinks of any possible danger to him. Again, Stephen, that silver bullet is queer. How do you mean queer? Well, you know the medieval superstition that a warlock can be killed only by a silver bullet. A thing of that sort is exactly what would appeal to the dreamy nature of Sidney. He is something of a mystic himself, remember. He might have taken it into his head that Carr was a warlock who had dealings with the devil. I'm sure he would have every reason to think so, said Marsh Carr. If any man was hand in gloves with Satan, my uncle was that man. You see what you say yourself? Then Sidney, thinking in a less sane fashion on the same subject, might have considered it his duty to deliver the world from such a wizard. He would certainly then use a silver bullet, thinking, according to the medieval superstition, that the man could not be killed by ordinary lead. It's all theory, said Stephen gloomily, and fantastic at that. As you say, all theory and fantastic, admitted Herrick. But you must remember that we are dealing with a fantastic nature. But we must see this boy and question him when we get home. He will deny everything. On the contrary, if I know anything of the boy, he will calmly admit what he has done. You will not tell Bess or Ida? That would be unwise. We must be certain of Sidney first. We shall say nothing tonight but get Sidney to come over to the Pines on the morrow and ask him frankly if he killed Carr. Bess is sure to ask you about Frisco, said Stephen. Oh, I can baffle her curiosity, replied Herrick. I shall tell her nothing about my visit to the man. All about his arrest she can know. I think it will be better to hold our tongues altogether, Jim. Ida is getting worried by this incessant mystery, although she knows very little. I'm sure I don't wonder. I worry myself, however. We must learn what we can from Sidney. I hope to heaven the lad is innocent, but if he is not, I don't look upon him in the light of an ordinary criminal. He is a freak of nature. Were I put into the witness box, I could not say on my oath that he is mad. Let us drop the subject, said Stephen, who looked haggard. I am getting nervous and anxious. 
Jim acquiesced in this sensible view, and the two betook themselves to the magazines and newspapers. Until they arrived at Beelminster, they said little to one another, and even then were, for them, taciturn. A groom and a cart awaited them, and they drove to Saxham in silence. It did not do to talk of Sydney with a servant at their elbows. But curiously enough, the groom had news for Stephen, which brought in the name of Sydney. Please, sir, that Italian woman. What is the matter with her? asked Herrick, who was driving. She is very ill, sir, and it is said she will die. Die? echoed Stephen in surprise. She was not bad enough for that when I saw her last. What do you think, Herrick? She looked very sick, certainly, but as far as I can judge, was in no immediate danger of death. Who says this, Perry? The groom sunk his voice to a whisper and seemed nervous. Master Sidney, he said. Both men looked round at this, then at each other. Herrick was first to break the silence. When did Master Sidney say that, Perry? Yesterday, sir, Mr. Knapper. He met him in Beelminster, in the Cathedral Square, about four o'clock. He asked him, joking, like, where he was going. Master Sidney said, just as quiet as he does, speak, sir, that he was going to see the Italian woman die. Knapper, was that taken back? You could have knocked him down with a feather, sir. Then Master Sidney said she would die in two days, which I take to mean, sir, that she'll go off tomorrow. And I'm sure she will, sir, added Perry with conviction. Is this story known, Perry? asked his master, rather vexed. No, sir. Knapper went at once to see Miss Endicott when he came back to Saxon. She asked him to say nothing about it, but he had already told Phelps the gardener, sir. Then Phelps told us all, sir, but we have said nothing outside about it. See you don't, then, said Stephen sharply. The first of my servants who says a word will be discharged. Mind that, Perry. The groom touched his hat and relapsed into silence. Where is Master Sidney now, Perry? asked Herrick, after a pause. At the house in Beelminster, sir. He has been there all night. Miss Endicott went over, but she could not get him away. He says he must stay there until the Italian woman dies, sir. Hm. You need say no more, Perry. And the doctor drove on in silence. But Marsh Carr knew, from the way he urged the mayor, how perturbed he was over this information. Stephen was upset himself. There was something disquieting about everything in connection with Sidney. After dinner at the Pines, Herrick made Stephen lie down, as he was yet far from strong, and walked across the Biffstead. Here he saw the two girls and Frank, who were very much troubled by this latest freak of their brother. "'I don't know what to do with him,' said Frank. I went over and insisted he should come home. I took him by the shoulder to force him out of the house, but he got in such a passion that I thought he would have a fit. So I left him until you came back. You go over and get him away, Jim, implored Ida. You have more influence over him than anyone else. I have gone, and Bess also, but he will not come. We can't carry him back by main force and make a scandal. I'll go, said Herrick, but I did not know that I had any influence with him. He is a lad one can do nothing with. How does the old woman take his telling her she is about to die? She is quite calm. Evidently, she thinks Sidney is a kind of prophet. He is telling her not to be afraid and talking the queerest things to her. I am sure Sidney is mad, sobbed Ida. He will be shut up in an asylum some day. Herrick said nothing. The poor girl little knew how truly she spoke. If Sidney had indeed killed Carr, he would certainly be shut up. Considering his extraordinary character, perhaps this would be all the better for his friends and relatives, if not for himself. I will go over in the morning, said Herrick, on reflection. He may be more reasonable in the morning. 
I am beginning to understand him a little. I'm sure I don't, said Ida, and Frank echoed her opinion. This was natural enough. No man is a hero to his relatives. All this time Bess said nothing. While Jim was away, she had worried much over her brother's freak, but now that the doctor had returned, she was satisfied that all would be well. Herrick exercised over Bess the same influence he did over most people he came into contact with. Stephen and the girls were both more than ordinarily intelligent, but they deferred to Jim in a most remarkable manner. If anyone could manage Sidney, Bess felt that Herrick was the man. Jim was not so certain himself. The boy had never come under his influence, and, in his own calm way, held his own against everyone. "'What about Frisco?' asked Bess, who had followed Herrick down the avenue. "'Has he really been arrested?' Dr. Jim nodded. "'Santiago betrayed him to some private inquiry agents I employed,' he said. "'A mean, shabby piece of work, Bess. Joyce put it down to me. I assured him that I had nothing to do with the matter, but he refused to believe me. He is so mean himself that he could not believe any good of other people, said Bess scornfully. What is to be done now about Frisco? I am thinking, replied her lover evasively. When I have come to a conclusion, I'll tell you, Bess, but I fancy the end is in sight. I hope so, sighed the girl. I am so tired of this anxiety. Shortly, you will have no more, dear. And Jim took her in his arms to kiss her goodbye. The night is dark, but the dawn is breaking. Next morning, Dr. Herrick walked over the Beelminster. He left Stephen at home, although the squire wanted to come also. No, said Jim, it is best for me to speak to the boy alone. I'll get more out of him. And Stephen recognized that this was the more sensible course. It was eleven o'clock when Herrick rapped at the door of the Beelminster house. It was opened by Sidney, who looked calm and complacent as usual. I heard you had come back, Dr. Jimmy said. Did your prophetic instinct tell you that? asked Herrick testily. The boy was so difficult to understand that he could not help feeling annoyed. A man over thirty does not like treating a lad of sixteen as his equal, yet Sidney somehow compelled that respect. No, replied he sweetly, I am very stupid about some things. When a thought comes to me, it comes. I cannot call it. Then the thought came to you that Petronella would die? She will die, Dr. Jim. Two days ago, I felt that she would die. So I came over to see her. She was afraid of death. Till I talked to her, now she is quite peaceful. She does not fear. Are you afraid of death, Sidney? Why should I be? I know. You know what? That there is nothing to be afraid of. The boy spoke quite serenely and without any suggestion of pose. He had conducted Herrick to the dining room, and the two were seated opposite one another. On the table were the remains of Sidney's breakfast, a glass of milk, some fruit, and a loaf of bread. I had to get these myself, he said. Petronella is in bed in Mrs. Marsh's room. She is very ill. I knew she was ill some time ago, replied Herrick, trying to assert himself. But I think I can cure her. She will not live, said Sidney, staring in the most unwinking manner at Dr. Jim. She will die before sunset, I know. Can you explain how you know? asked the doctor roughly. This time it was the boy who was puzzled. I can't, he said. I feel that Petronella will die. I can say no more than that. Herrick groaned. It was useless to try and understand this extraordinary lad. Evidently, he did not understand himself. Yet, his former prophecies had come to pass so absolutely that Dr. Jim could not help thinking that this last would come true also. However, this was not the business about which he had come. Sidney he said after a pause, do you know that Frisco, who used to be with Colonel Carr, has been arrested? I heard Bess say so. What do you think of it? 
I never thought of it at all. He is in no danger, Dr. Jim. It was not Frisco who killed Colonel Carr. How do you know that? asked Herrick, startled. Was the boy about to confess that he was guilty? I was in the house just after Colonel Carr was killed. Oh, then you did not shoot him yourself? Sidney frowned, but appeared very little disturbed. Why should I have killed him? he said calmly. Colonel Carr was a wicked man. I told him he would die by violence some day, but he only laughed at me. He thought I was mad or a fool. You do also, Dr. Jim. I don't know what to think, said Jim angrily. I never met anyone like you before, Sidney. If I had not some knowledge that the things you say come true, I should think you are pretending. A boy like you ought to be whipped. That is what the colonel said, replied Sidney quietly. But tell me, Dr. Jim, did you really think I had killed him? I did not, but Frisco says you did. If he believed that, he would not have run away, said Sidney shrewdly. Well, come to the point. Who murdered the colonel? Petronella, said Sidney. Herrick rose up with a look of surprise. Astonished as he was, he could hardly help laughing. This statement bore out his speech to Stephen. He had said that Sidney would accuse someone else. Now it only remained for Petronella to shift the blame onto the shoulders of a third party. I do not believe that, said Herrick. Why should Petronella kill Carr? You had better come up and hear what she has to say, Dr. Jim. In a moment, but tell me how you know, through your instinct. Sidney shook his head. No, that feeling only comes at times, he said. I do not pretend to know everything. I said so before. I don't know why you should look at me as queer, Dr. Jim, he continued plaintively. It is not my fault if things come into my head. When they do, I sometimes tell people, but not always. I don't like being laughed at. You're a queer fish, muttered Dr. Jim, annoyed by this human problem he could not understand. I should like you to be examined by a committee of doctors. They would not understand, Dr. Jim, and I can't explain. But you want to hear how I knew? Well, on the night Colonel Carr was killed, I went to the Pine Wood after seven o'clock. Had you any premonition that he would be murdered? No, I had no feeling of any kind. I was in the wood for some time. At half-past seven I felt hungry, but I did not want to go to Biffstead, as I knew Ida would try and keep me in. It was raining, but I did not mind that. I like the open air where I can breathe. A house makes me choke. I understand. Go on. As I was hungry, I thought I would go and get something from Colonel Carr. I sometimes went to see him, though I did not like him. He was always kind to me, although I think he was afraid. Well, I went into the house just before eight. You said half-past seven just now. I did not go in at once, said the boy, with a gesture of irritation. Do not interrupt me, Dr. Jim. I went into the dining room and found the dinner on the table. But the colonel was not there. I took a piece of bread and some water. While I was eating, I heard a shot. I wondered what it was. You did not feel that murder was committed? No. Why should I have felt? I just wondered what the shot might be. After a bit, I went out into the hall to see if the colonel had come in. I thought he might be out. I saw Petronella run through the hall and out into the night. I wondered what she was doing there and followed her, but I lost her as she went through the woods. Then I walked about for a time up till nine. I thought again about the shot and went back to the house. I went up the tower and saw Colonel Carr lying dead, so I knew Petronella had killed him. I came down the... How was it you did not meet Frisco, who had gone up to see the Colonel? I heard someone coming and went into a lower room. I thought it might be Petronella coming back. I saw it was Frisco and saw him come down again. Then I came and said to him, he is quite dead, and went out. After that, I went on the moor. Then sometimes afterwards, 
I heard three more shots. I saw Bess and her lantern and went home. Why did you say nothing of all this before? asked Herrick. There was no reason. If Frisco had been caught before, I should have told you. But he had got away, and I did not think it was right to tell about Petronella. Colonel Carr was a wicked man, and he deserved to be killed. He did a lot of harm, said Sidney, with a shudder. How comes it you tell me now, Sidney? Because Bess told me Frisco had been arrested. He is wicked, too, but I do not want to see him hang for shooting Carr, as I knew that he was innocent. I came over to see Petronella, for I had a feeling that she would die, and I wanted to know from herself before she died if she was guilty. She denied it at first, but I said I would not go away until she told me all. That was why I stayed all night. She tried to run away. I said I would tell the police. That was unlike you, Sidney. No, it wasn't, replied the boy positively. I knew that Petronella was the one who shot Carr. If she did not confess, Frisco would be hanged. You never thought that you might be accused? No, I did not do it, replied Sidney calmly. Why should I be accused? Herrick sighed impatiently. The boy could not or would not understand. I suppose then Petronella confessed in the end? Yes, I made her write it down that she killed Carr. It is in Italian, but I do not know the language. You must see that it is all right, Dr. Jim. I did that because I thought she might die before you arrived. But now you are here, come up and see her. I will go for Inspector Bridge. Dr. Jim was aghast. Here was Sidney in his new character. Why for Bridge? He must hear her confession, said Sidney, putting on his hat. Perhaps she has written down something different in the Italian. I will give you the paper when I come back. But I must go for Bridge, and Sidney, before Herrick could say a word, was out of the room. Dr. Jim heard the front door close behind the boy. There is not much insanity about this act, muttered Herrick to himself. I shall see Petronella at once, he smiled grimly. I wonder who she will accuse, he said. End of chapter 25「Chapter Twenty Six of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Truth In the room where Mrs. Marsh had died, and in the same bed, lay the old Italian woman dying also. She was sitting up with a red woolen shawl wrapped round her bony shoulders, and her lean hands told her rosary. Whatever view Sidney might have instilled into her regarding life beyond the grave, Petronella still remained within the fold of Peter. She was muttering prayer after prayer with a feverish haste, and the black beads slipped quickly from between her fingers. The room was dusky, dark, and untidy. Near the bed was a bottle of Chianti and some bread, but the flask was full and the loaf untouched. Petronella was past earthly food. Herrick saw the mark of death on her yellow face. She seemed pleased to see him and not at all afraid. Receiving him with a chuckle, she interpreted the look in his eyes. So he has told you, that young Signor, she said in her own tongue. Ah, I thought he would. It was time. But too late, Signor, Doctore, too late for the prison. I go into purgatory. Ten pounds for masses, Signor. You'll see that they are said. Then I may get into paradise to rest. I need rest. All my life I have worked hard. The good God will not be hard on poor old Petronella. Dr. Jim took a chair by the bedside and felt her pulse. You need nourishing food, Petronella, he said soothingly. A cup of soup now. Eh, uh, eh, uh, Signor Doctore, that will not help me. I am dying. You do not know. I never told you. Cancer, Signor, a bad cancer. I shall die. I may be able to. 
No, I do not want that. They would put me in prison. Let me die. The unsignor said I would die. It is foolish to live. I will go to my padrona and explain. Then you did shoot the colonel, Petronella? Si, si. The old woman coughed. He was a devil man. He was cruel to my padrona, to the young signor. Also, he had the evil eye, hard to kill. Oh, yes, she chuckled. But the silver bullet. Ah, yes, the silver bullet. Dr. Jim looked at her in silence. He wondered that he had not suspected Petronella before. After Bess had told him about the bullet, he had been certain that the person who had fired the shot was of a superstitious nature. Mrs. Marsh, being Italian, might have thought of the same thing. But she was educated and above such folly. Petronella, a woman of the people with feudal instincts, had clung to that wild belief of the Middle Ages. She was the one person of Dr. Jim's acquaintances who would have dreamed of such a thing, and her he had not suspected. Why did you use a silver bullet, Petronella? Ah, uh, the man was a divalo, a witch creature. He had the evil eye. Did I not meet with an accident after he had overlooked me? It was better that he should die, rather than live to ruin the signora. A silver bullet? Only in that way, signor, can those aid it by the devil perish. I am not sorry. No, it was a good deed. The young signor said so. All the same, Petronella, I must tell you that Frisco is accused of this murder. He is in prison. It is unfair that he should suffer for what you have done. So you must make confession. I have done so, signor Doctore. I wrote with my own hand in my own language that I, Petronella, had slain this devil man with a silver bullet. Even so, said Herrick, but I want to write down your confession myself. You can sign it, and the police officer can witness it. Thus will the man who is in prison for your crime be saved. The police, echoed Petronella, I, I knew they would come, but they will not put me in prison, Signor. I die, I die, and that soon. Ah, as you will. But you have been good to me. I will do what you want. Yonder in the corner, Signor, the Padrona's ink and pen, also the paper. Write down what I say, and I will sign. What does it matter now I die? Jim found the materials, and placing them on the little round table, looked at Petronella. She nodded and muttered a prayer, then began to speak in her usual rapid manner. She spoke in Italian, but Dr. Jim, for the benefit of Bridge, translated it into English. Luckily, Herrick was an excellent linguist and found no difficulty in doing this. Signor, began Petronella, it happened in this way. I was at the house of that devil man with the Signora, oh, a long time ago. The Padrona went to ask him for money. He refused. The cursed robber and we were so poor, so poor. My signora, the last of a great race. Poor. Grand Dio. It was evil that she should be poor. But the devil man would give not one lira. Ah, no, he kept all. I was angered because of my padrona. I saw on the table a cup of silver, and that I took. You stole the cup? Why not? My padrona was poor. That devil man saw me. He struck me. Yes, even me, Petronella, a free Italian. And he overlooked me with his evil eye. I shuddered. I knew that I would have an accident, and the next day I hurt myself. Ah, the wicked wretch! I gave back the cup as he made me. But when we went down the stairs, I took another of silver. This time he saw me not, and I carried it here under my shawl. What did Mrs. Marsh say? My padrona was angry, but I did not care. I did not sell the silver cup, as she was angered, but I kept it, yes, for the silver bullet. Herrick looked up from his writing. Had you made up your mind then to kill Colonel Carr? he asked. No, not then, 
I should have liked to, because he cast on me the evil eye. Ah, Dio mio, I made horns, but it was no use. I had an accident. No, Signor Doctore, I did not wish to kill him then, very much. Later on, when the will, the will... Did you know about the will? Si, si, it was that Frisco told me. I was in the market, he also, and he had the wine in him. He talked foolishly and said that his senor would make another will leaving all the money to him. I saw that my poor Padrona and the young Signor Stefano would be ruined. I came back and told the Signora. She was angered. Then she said she would go to see this devil man. Signor, here Petronella clutched Herrick by the wrist. I knew that my Padrona had a temper. She could rage. I feared what she might do. I watched. Ah, yes, I watched. She was to dine with the Padre at Saxham, and then see the wicked Signor. Did you not know she would see him in the afternoon? No, she said she would go about nine and see him, that after his dinner he would be in a good temper and might not do this wrong. Signor, I saw that she took with her a pistol. The revolver of Mr. Marsh? See, si, see, si, she took it from the case in the room of the young Signor Stefano. I saw her. I knew that if the devil man laughed at her, she would kill him. Yes, she would. No, Petronella, said Dr. Jim soothingly. She only meant to frighten him. So she said in the letter you gave me. No, Signor, replied the old woman indignantly. The daughter of the Michelotti would not be so weak. She would have killed him. Upon my soul, muttered Herrick, I believe she would. I was in great alarm, Signor, went on Petronella. I thought if she did so that she would be put in prison. It was terrible to think so. I was angered against the devil man. He had struck me. He had looked upon me with the evil eye. Now he would tempt my Signora to kill him, and so be put in prison. I saw that all would be lost. Then I said to myself, to me, Petronella, that I would kill him alone. The old woman drew herself up in bed and looked majestic as she spoke. Herrick was profoundly sorry for her. She had carried her feudal instincts to excess, and had so jeopardized her life for the sake of her mistress. He understood well how she had been urged to do this, the blow, the evil eye, the possibility of her young master being ruined by another will, and above all, the chance that her signora might kill the man herself, a fiery, faithful creature like Petronella, could not let such things be. As she said, she made up her mind to kill Carr, before Mrs. Marsh could see him. Where she made the mistake was that she thought her mistress would see the man at night. As a matter of fact, she did, but already had seen him in the day. Perhaps Mrs. Marsh guessed what Petronella might do, and she had told a falsehood about the time of calling at the Pines. When the Signora departed, said Petronella, rocking to and fro, for she was in pain, I got my pistol. See, si, Signor, it was the pistol of my husband. He fought for the king when we freed Italy. I, too, was in the war. I shot many, oh, many. He showed me. I was not afraid to shoot. This piece of information showed Herrick how it was Carr had been shot through the heart. Petronella having been in the Italian War of Liberation, knew how to handle firearms. Probably she was an excellent markswoman. The shooting of Carr proved her to be so. I had bullets, said Petronella, but they were of lead. I knew that the devil man, protected by the wicked one, could not be slain by only leaden bullets. I wanted a silver one. Ah, grand Dio, there was no silver in this house. Then I thought of the cup I had taken. I got it and melted it down over a big fire. I made three bullets in the mold of my husband. I took his powder flask, but it was empty. The young Signor Stefano had powder in his room. I stole it. 
Then I loaded the pistol and set it aside till the night. Where was Mr. Marsh all this time? asked Herrick. He was in the house in the afternoon and went to eat with a friend of his, Senor Barker. The newspaper editor, said Dr. Jim. He remembered that this was the man who looked after the Beominster Chronicle and took an interest in Stephen's poetry. He dined with him, si, Senor, and said he would not be back till late. He was to bring home the Senora from Saxon. I was all alone, and I saw what I could do. And what did you do, Petronella? I hid the pistol in my shawl and walked to Saxon. I got there before eight. I went to the big house. I found it empty. I climbed the stairs where I knew the devil man would be in the tower. He was standing by his bed, dressed to eat. He took up a pistol, but let it down when he saw it was only old Petronella. You mean he still held the pistol? Yes, I waited for a moment, as he stared at me, and then shot him. I aimed for the heart, said Petronella, hugging her knees. The silver bullet went through the heart. Oh, my husband showed me how to shoot, senor. What did you do then? I made sure the devil man was dead. He fell on his face. Then I went down the stairs. I saw someone. I did not know who it was. But the young signor told me he was there. I ran through the pine wood, and he followed. I hid behind a tree, and then after a time I got home. No one knew that I had been out. And when the signora and the young signor Stefano came back, I said nothing. The senora looked white. She said nothing to me, but I knew that she had seen the devil man. What did I care? She could not kill him again. That is all, senor. You lost the pistol? I lost my husband's pistol, said Petronella precisely. It dropped from my pocket when I ran. I did not care. No one would know that it belonged to me. Then I heard Frisco had gone. I was glad. They would not think. I had killed the devil man. Didn't Mrs. Marsh suspect? My signora? No, she said nothing. I was certain she had fired the other three shots, for I know my signora. Also, I looked at the revolver in the case when she put it back. If Frisco had been arrested at once, would you have spoken out? No, Frisco was a bad man, too. I would be glad if they put him in prison. Why do you tell me now, then? The young signor made me tell. Ah, he is a terrible young signor. He makes me afraid. He said I would die, and that I must tell at once, or he would speak to the police. Well, I have told, and I die. Have you all down, signor? I will sign. Ah, Dio mio, she started up in bed. The police. It was indeed Bridge who entered with a red face and astonished eyes. He was followed by Sidney, looking calm, just as though the inspector had not been scolding him all the way because he had not told about Petronella before. But it took someone stronger than Inspector Bridge to frighten Sidney. For a moment, the inspector stared at the bed and at his prisoner as he regarded the old woman. Then he spoke to Dr. Jim. This is an extraordinary thing, sir, he said slowly. Very, assented Herrick. I only knew of it myself an hour ago. I thought this young gentleman was telling me a lie. It is the truth, said Petronella, pointing to Herrick. The Signor has written all down. Here, see me sign my name, and you can say I signed it. Inspector Bridge wanted to talk, but Dr. Jim made him a sign to be silent. The old woman was sinking fast, and there was no time to be lost. With great difficulty, she signed her name. Herrick and Bridge appended their signatures, and all was over. This will set Frisco free, said Bridge, and now I must see about getting a warrant out for this woman. It is too late, said Dr. Jim. She's dying. She won't die, said Bridge, with a disdainful smile. All this is done to cheat the law. I have a policeman downstairs. He shall come up and watch her while I go for a warrant of arrest. 
She will die before sunset, said Sidney calmly, and went to the old woman. He took her hand. Goodbye, Petronella. You will be happy soon. You know what is to be done. Si, si, I know. I am happy. I will go to my husband, said Petronella. Then she looked at Dr. Jim with a worn smile. I did it for my senora, she said. You can go. You can do me no good now. Herrick saw that well enough. However, he went to see if he could get a nurse to heat some soup and revive the woman. To be sure, it was little use bringing her back to health and strength just to hang her. But Dr. Jim acted for the best. He went out with Sidney and the inspector, leaving two policemen in charge. Bridge had the confession in his pocket and intended to go up to town to deliver it into the hands of the proper authorities. Frisco had to be released, seeing that he was innocent. And I always thought he was, said Bridge, lying in the most shameless manner. Sidney looked after the man with a queer smile when he went away. He's only wasting time, said the boy. We may keep the old woman alive till tomorrow, said Herrick. Sidney shook his head. She will die before sunset, he said. Out of sheer perversity, Dr. Jim wanted to thwart this prophecy. He saw that bad as Petronella was, she could be kept alive by stimulants, and this he intended to do, if only to baffle this extraordinary boy. For once in a way he wished to prove Sidney in the wrong. The boy, perhaps, guessed his intentions, for he smiled again and then said abruptly that he was going back to Saxon. Will you tell them what has happened? asked Herrick. No, replied Sidney, after a pause. I'm not fond of talking. You can tell them if you like. Very good, said Dr. Jim coolly. Then you ask Ida, Frank, and Bess to be at the Pines about five o'clock. I shall return by that time, and then everything can be explained. Thank heaven we know the truth at last. It is about time that the matter came to an end. Will you be at the Pines also? I'm going to have a long sleep, said Sidney. I feel very tired. He turned away with a nod, and Herrick stared after him. Jim was a doctor of the most advanced school. He had studied much, he was quick in seeing things, and on the whole prided himself on his knowledge. But he could make nothing of Sidney, the boy, and his ways were beyond him altogether. Sidney would have baffled a committee of doctors. Herrick searched for a nurse and found one speedily, for he knew where to go. He brought her back to the house and set her to heat some soup. Then he gave various directions, sent out for certain medicine, and did what he could to revive the strength of the old woman. Bridge allowed Petronella to have the bedroom to herself, but he kept two policemen in the house and got out his warrant. Nothing was known in the town about the matter, as Bridge wished to wait until all was in order before telling the public. He foresaw the glory would accrue to him by the story he intended to tell. He had resolved to give Sidney and Herrick no more credit than he could help. Dr. Jim guessed as much when he heard Bridge talking, but he was rather pleased than otherwise. He did not want this latest freak of the uncanny changeling to be talked about. Besides, Bridge amused him. He was so very human in his love of praise. His philanthropic work being ended, Herrick walked back to Saxon. He reached the Pines some time after five, and already found the assembled party impatiently expecting his arrival. Sidney, it appeared, had just said sufficient to pique the curiosity of his family. He hinted that some untoward event had occurred with which Herrick was connected, but refused to say what it was. Then he had retired to bed in full daylight and announced that he was going to sleep for twenty-four hours. What was to be done with such a boy? He grows more eccentric every day, sighed Ida. Stephen laughed. Oh, his eccentricities are harmless enough, that is, if 
Here he caught Herrick's eyes and hesitated. He did not know but what Sidney might have confessed the crime of which Frisco had accused him. Oh, that's all right, said Jim cheerily. What is? asked Bess, wondering at the sudden relief expressed on Stephen's face. Jim, you have something to tell us? Yes, something very important about the murder. The murder of Carr? cried Frank, astonished. Oh, I thought that was done with long ago. On the contrary, said Dr. Jim, I have been working at it all these months trying to learn the truth. Stephen and Bess have been helping me. Well, said Ida, looking from her lover to the doctor, I do call it mean. I should have been told. It would only have worried you, dear, said the squire. But what is the difficulty? cried Frank, puzzled. Frisco killed the colonel. There was no secret about that. Frisco did not kill Carr, said Herrick. The jury were wrong. So were we all. It was Petronella who shot the man. Stephen jumped up as Bess uttered a cry of amazement. Petronella, he stammered. Thank God Sidney did not do it. Sidney, cried Bess and Ida in a breath. Herrick hurriedly explained. Frisco accused Sidney because he was in the house at the time of the murder. That was when you were looking for him, Bess. Do you remember? I should think so, she cried. No wonder I could not find him. But Petronella? Was the pistol hers and the silver bullet? What are you talking about, Bess, dear? Let me explain, said Dr. Jim, before Bess could answer Ida. It is a long story, and I think you will find it interesting. And then Herrick told the whole complicated case from the time he and Joyce found the dead body of Colonel Carr in the tower, which now no longer existed. He was frequently interrupted with exclamations of horror from Ida and a rage from Frank. When he ended, the latter jumped up. If I meet that little wretch Joyce again, said Frank, I'll break every bone in his body. The idea of trying to mix up Bess in the matter. He has received a worse punishment than a thrashing, said Stephen. I think you can leave him to the punishment of destiny, Frank. A babble of voices ensued. Everyone was talking at once, and for fully an hour they discussed the case in all its bearings. I suppose Frisco will be released now, said Bess triumphantly. I knew that he was innocent. I said so all along. All the same, he's a bad lot, remarked Herrick. The less we have to do with him, the better. I don't think he'll come down here again in a hurry, said Marsh Carr, thankfully. And Santiago has sailed for Mexico. Thus, we are rid of the whole gang. Hello, what's that? It was a violent ringing at the door. And Herrick started to his feet, looking perturbed. I hope nothing is wrong, he said. I'm getting so nervous with all this that I'm always expecting the worst of tidings. As he spoke, the footman ushered in Inspector Bridge in a state of excitement. The man could hardly speak and was scarlet in the face with suppressed rage and alarm. I beg your pardon, he said to the company, but this woman, Petronella? What is the matter? asked Dr. Jim. She is dead. All looked at one another, and before sunset, remarked Herrick, thinking of Sidney, how did it happen, Bridge? She had a bottle of chloral under her pillow, and while the nurse's back was turned, she drank it. I was called too late. She is as dead as a doornail, and has spoiled a most beautiful case. Leaving the others to discuss the matter with Bridge, Herrick hastily excused himself. He ran across the Biffstead and up into Sidney's bedroom. The boy was sleeping quietly, but Dr. Jim woke him promptly. I say, he cried, shaking the boy's shoulder, she is dead. Petronella, said Sidney drowsily, I know she is. I said she would die before sunset. You told her to take that chloral? No, said Sidney in a sleepy manner. She wanted to take it before she confessed, but I stopped her. But she was bound to die. I said she might get out of the world more easily if she took it. I dare say 
She died quietly in a sleep. "'You have behaved shamefully,' cried Herrick, wrathfully. "'No, she was bound to die in any case. Why should she not die as she pleased? Go away, Dr. Jim, I want to sleep.' And Sidney closed his eyes. Herrick, in face of this calmness, was helpless. So he departed. The boy had baffled him to the very end. End of chapter 26「Chapter twenty seven of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In this way, the trouble left as a legacy by the wicked colonel came to an end. Frisco was duly tried, and on the confession of Petronella, he was acquitted. A very meagre report of the proceedings appeared in the newspapers. In taking down the confession, Herrick had not inserted the fact of Mrs. Marsh's connection with the matter. Frisco said nothing to his counsel about the three shots fired after the colonel was dead. Therefore, the name of Stephen's stepmother was spared the disgrace of her mad, impulsive act. For obvious reasons, the most interesting part of the case was left untold, and the public never knew the complications that had ensued in searching for the assassin. Frisco was tried briefly, was acquitted, and when set free he disappeared. Where he went no one knew, and no one cared. By the advice of Dr. Jim, Stephen paid the Belcher and Kid the reward that he had promised for the capture of Frisco. Herrick was afraid that if it was not paid, that the two might search into the matter more particularly than would be agreeable to the feelings of Marsh Carr. Stephen saw this danger himself and gladly sent a check for the money. Belcher and Kidd will get no more business from Dr. Herrick. And I hope I never come in connection with detective business again, said Herrick earnestly. It is all very well to read about but in real life it is not so pleasant. However, we have done with it all. Certainly he was done with the case, but not entirely with Frisco. One day the ex-sailor arrived at Saxham and asked to see Mr. Marsh Carr. At the time Stephen was indoors, and luckily for him, Dr. Herrick had not gone out. When the name of Frisco was given, the two looked at one another in surprise. They had hoped never to hear it again. "'Shall I see him, Jim?' asked Stephen doubtfully. "'Certainly. I shall see him also,' replied Herrick. "'He can have come here for no good purpose. But I would rather have him as an open enemy than striking in the dark.' The consequence of this speech was that Frisco was shown into the library. He was glad to see Marsh Carr, and visibly annoyed, to find that the doctor was present. "'My business is private,' said Frisco. "'You must tell it to me in the presence of Dr. Herrick,' said Stephen, scenting trouble. "'I do nothing without his advice.' "'Worse luck,' growled Frisco, and sat down with a scowl. Herrick laughed. "'You do not seem pleased that you have escaped the gallows, Frisco,' he said, "'or perhaps you are sorry the criminal did not turn out to be Sidney Endicott.' "'I don't—' care a fig who it was, so long as it wasn't me, replied the ex-sailor. Huh. Fancy Carr being shot by an old hag after going through all the dangers he did. Always thought he'd have a mean end. This is beside the point, said Stephen, as I suppose you did not come here to criticize my uncle. You had better tell me your business. It's not pleasant business, said Frisco coolly. So I should expect, seeing that you have come about it, said the squire. However, I shall be pleased to hear what it is. Frisco took a paper out of his pocket. I don't think you will, he said. I have here, Mr. Marsh Carr, the last will of the colonel. Stephen started to his feet and turned pale. Herrick, who had been listening intently, struck in. I suppose it leaves all the money to you, Mr. Joyce Frisco? No, growled Frisco, and you needn't, senor. It's a good will for you if it's true what Robin says. And what does Robin say? 
that you are to marry Miss Bess. That is perfectly true, replied Herrick coolly, but I do not see what she has to do with your business. You will soon, Dr. Herrick. The money is left to her. What? cried Stephen loudly. Carr has left his money to Bess? You bet. Here's the will. And Frisco threw it across the table. He said she was the only man amongst the lot of you. See how honest I am, Herrick? I want to make you a rich man, cause you stood by me in trouble. I never forget a pal, not me. Meantime, Stephen and Jim were looking over the paper. Why, cried Herrick, bursting into a laugh. It's not worth the paper it's written on. Here's the Colonel's signature, but there are no witnesses. Ah, you see that, do you? said Frisco with a chuckle. That's so, but I tell you, that if my milksop had married the girl, my fool son Robin, I mean, there would have been witnesses, and the will would have been proved in law. I dare say, said Stephen, who sat down again with a recovered color. Well, even if this will had have been genuine, I should not have minded. There is no one I would give the money to sooner than Dr. Herrick. Stuff and nonsense, cried Jim although he reddened with pleasure at this tribute of friendship. As if I or Bess would have taken a penny of it. Oh, I see what your game was, Frisco. You wanted Robin to marry Bess, and then you would have got witnesses to this will, and taken the money from Stephen. Is that so? That is so, rejoined Frisco, leaning back. As the fool could not get the girl, I tried the other plan of stopping Marsh going to the vault. That failed because of you, Dr. Herrick. If it had not been for you, I'd have had that money. You confess your villainies very coolly, said Marsh Carr sharply. Do you know that I can lay you by the heels for that assault? Oh, no, you can't. T'was Santiago struck you. You can't prove that I had anything to do with it. And, said Frisco impudently, you would not if you could. Remember, I held my tongue about. Yes, yes, said Stephen hastily. It was good of you to say nothing about my unhappy mother. I am so far indebted to you. Ah, that's just what I've come about. What do you mean, asked Jim sharply. Lord Doc, you ain't half sharp enough. I want the squire here to give me a thousand pounds to start afresh. I and Robin are going back to the States and we want something to begin life on. That's only fair, put in Stephen eagerly. I am. Wait a bit, said Jim. Let us hear on what grounds Frisco asks you to do this. Frisco was quite ready to show grounds. Well, in the first place, I held my tongue about Mrs. Marsh firing at the dead body. Yes, I owe you something for that, said Stephen, flushing and wincing. In the second, said Frisco, raising his finger. I brought you that will, unwitnessed, so that you can still keep the money. If Robin had got the girl, I shouldn't have done that. My name is one witness, and Santiago has another, and where would you be? Santiago was never in this house, said Herrick, and a will has to be signed when the tester and the witnesses are together. Oh, I'd have arranged all that. My own signature you could not dispute as I was Carr's right-hand man. I'd have paid Santiago half a year's income to sign. He'd have done it like a shot, and the will would have stood any test then. That is true enough, said Herrick, reflectively. So long as the colonel's signature was right, the rest was easy. Where did you get this will? It was on his table. He must have been fooling with it when the old woman, Petronella, shot him. It was about this will that Mrs. Marsh made such a fuss, only she thought the money was to be left to me. Ah, you let that out yourself? Being drunk, said Frisco with a laugh, well, I took away the will and afterwards thought to use it by marrying Robin to Bess Endicott. But you see, Mr. Marsh, he added, turning to Stephen, I did not have the witnesses' names put so you keep the money instead of handing it over to Miss Bess. Whether he had done so or not, cried Dr. Jim hotly, Bess 
would not have taken it. The money is rightfully Stevens. Ah, that brings me to the third point, said Frisco, unmoved. I worked for that money. I went through hot and cold and danger to get it. Half of it should have been mine, but Carr had the whip hand on me, so I'm out of it. Now, gentlemen, I know where that cash is. If you'll give me a thousand to fit out an expedition, we'll cry quits. I and Robin are going to get more treasure. Carr didn't take away the lot. But remember that the Indians are warned, said Herrick. They have very likely removed the rest of the jewels. That's what I've got to find out, said Frisco, and Robin is coming along with me to be made a man of. Well, these three points, Mr. Marsh, are clear enough. I ought to have half the money, but as you have the upper hand, I ask a thousand pounds as my right. I certainly think you are entitled to that much, said Stephen. What do you say, Herrick? I'm with you, Steve. Give him the money. Frisco chuckled while Stephen wrote out a check for the amount. When the ex-sailor placed it in his pocket, he stood up to go. Well, gentlemen, he said, with some sort of emotion, I thank you for this treatment. You are both white men. I have behaved badly, but this makes all square. I can tell you one thing, Mr. Marsh, that you will have no further trouble about the money. Even if the Indians knew, they would do nothing to you now that Carr has gone. As to the plan, I dare say his body by this time is, well, no matter. I'll go out of your life, gentlemen, so does Robin, to be made a man of. There remains Santiago. He won't trouble you. I'm going to shoot him when I drop across him in Mexico. You can do what you like there, Frisco, I dare say. Another crime won't matter much to you. It wouldn't be a crime, but an act of justice. He played me a dirty trick, Dr. Herrick. However, I'm off. He won't shake hands, so I don't offer. So long, gentlemen both, said Frisco, walking towards the door. And may you live long and be happy. As to that devil car, Frisco spat and then departed. They never saw him again. A year later, information came through a newspaper stating the fate of an expedition that had gone into the interior of Peru. The Indians of the Cordilleras had attacked the camp, and the three white men who led the expedition were killed. Their names were Joyce, alias Frisco, his son Robin, and a Mexican called Santiago. Poor Robin, said Herrick, when he read this to his wife. He was a mean little scoundrel, but I'm sorry that he came to such an end. As to Santiago, Frisco must have made it up with him and taken him to look after the treasure. Well, the whole three are dead. Let us forget them. But this is anticipating. On the evening of the day when Frisco appeared, Stephen announced to the assembled Biffs that Dr. Herrick intended to accept half the income of the wicked colonel with the permission of Bess. Jim was on his feet at once. Come, he cried, very red. I intend to do nothing of the sort. What rubbish you are talking, Steve. I only asked Bess to read this paper, said Stephen, and gave Bess the incomplete will. Ah, true, replied Herrick. It is only fair that she should decide for herself, but I'll have no part in the matter. The colonel's going to leave his money to me, said Bess. Well, I never heard such nonsense, Stephen, as if I would take a penny from you or Ida. I told you so, cried Dr. Jim triumphantly. I knew Bess would think the same as I. Hurrah, Bess, kiss me. Is this a proper will, Steve? asked Ida, looking at the paper. No, Frisco brought it here today to cause trouble. But as you see, there are no witnesses, so it is not valid. And yet you want to offer me half the money? Take it, Bess, cried Ida. I am sure Stephen and I can live well on four thousand a year. I won't, said Bess. These were the Colonel's intentions, very kind, I'm sure. But even if the will were legal, I should not accept. Jim, am I not right? Perfectly right, darling. You and I will make our own way. It's all nonsense, said Stephen. You must take some money. 
It is only fair that the Colonel's intentions should be respected in some way. There was a great deal of argument. Finally, Bess and Dr. Herrick agreed to take one thousand a year for life. There, said Ida, kissing her sister, I hope that is all right. And now Jim will go away, said Stephen gloomily. Not until the year's end, and until the money is firmly in your possession, was the reply of the doctor. Remember, you have some months' visits to pay to the vault. Even though Frisco is gone, we must carry out the will. And at the end of the year? I'll establish myself in practice somewhere, said Dr. Herrick, perhaps in Beominster, so as to be near you. Bess can then go on writing for the Weekly Chronicle. Indeed, I shall write a novel, cried Bess. I want a London fame. And so it was settled. For a year, Herrick remained at the Pines with the squire. Then there was a double wedding. Ida and Stephen came back to live in the wicked colonel's house, and Dr. Herrick and his bride established himself in a comfortable mansion in Beominster. He became immensely popular, and also having married into a county family, he was much sought after by the county invalids. Frank and Sidney were left at Biffstead, and Flo came home to keep house for them. The Reverend Pentland Corn gave up his charge of the parish, and went out to the east as a missionary. No one could understand the reason for this folly, as they called it, save Herrick. He understood only too well, and his was the last hand Pentland Corn clasped when he left England for India. His place was taken by a young and amiable rector, who will probably marry Flo Endicott. Then Frank will have to keep house himself, or marry in self-defense. As to Sidney the queer boy, Herrick took the young gentleman in hand and tried to make him a healthy man. He made him ride, shoot, swim, and indulge in all manner of outdoor sports. At first, Sidney rebelled. But as he was really fond of Herrick, he began to take kindly to the regime. The consequence was he became more of a boy in a few months and actually began to eat meat. Herrick watched over him with the greatest care, and gradually Sidney lost his unpleasant faculty of seeing things. He went to college, and there he now is becoming rapidly more of a normal person. Once he met with a theophysist, who told him after hearing a story that he had sunk the spirit in the flesh and blamed Herrick severely. In fact, this gentleman took a journey to Saxon to see and expostulate with Herrick on the wickedness of debasing the psychic gifts of the boy. "'I would rather see him a healthy man,' said the doctor impatiently. "'In what you say, there may be a good deal. But the boy is now in better health and easier to live with. "'Ah, you do not deserve to have such a person in the family,' said the theophysist. "'But your work will not endure forever. You have made Mr. Endicott eat meat and materialized him. But in a few years he will recover his gift. It will be stronger than ever. Then I hope he won't come here, said Herrick. I have ever respect for persons so gifted, but I don't like them. To have one at your elbow, who sees into the future and foretells death, and is always seeing creatures of the air, is horrible. You are a skeptic, Dr. Herrick. No, I think there are many things of which we know nothing. I mean in regard to what we talk about. But for my part, I want to do my duty in this life and leave all these occult things to people who like them. I should like my brother-in-law to act likewise. However, he is in good health now, and I should be sorry to see him relapse into the state he was when I first met him. Thereupon the theophysist sighed and departed. All the same, he is keeping a watch over Sidney, and should the boy again develop the clairvoyant faculty, he will be made better use of by those who understand. And then a happy day came when in Stephen's arms was placed a boy. Bess Herrick placed him therein. Do you know who this is? she asked. My son and heir, replied Stephen, bending over the infant. What else, or who else, should he be? The first 
the very first really innocent creature who has been in this house for close upon a century. That is complimentary to us all, Bess, said her husband, who had entered the room. But what if he is? Bess looked solemn. I think he's the guardian angel of Ida and Steve to keep away the evil spirit of Colonel Carr. Come now, Bess, you are not like Sidney. You have not seen. I have seen nothing, Jim, but the village people are already making a legend about the wicked Colonel. They say he walks, I hope, now that this innocent child is here, that they will leave off inventing such horrid things. I don't want the Pines to have the reputation of being haunted. And you know how stories grow, Jim. I know this, replied Dr. Herrick, that Carr was murdered in a room which has vanished into thin air. If his ghost walks anywhere, it must be in the pine wood. There's no call for him to haunt this place. Someone repeated the saying of Herrick's, and what he had said in jest was spoken of in earnest. In a few months it was commonly reported that the wicked colonel had been seen in the pine wood, surrounded with a red glow, significant of the habitation of his spirit, for its sins dwelt in. In vain, more sensible people laughed at this tale. It came to be firmly believed in, and it was said that when any misfortune was about to befall the Marsh Carr family, that the shade of the colonel appeared. It is the penalty of greatness, said Dr. Jim to Stephen. A county family is not really respectable until it has its private ghost. And in this way, wicked Colonel Carr became a tradition. End of chapter 27 Recording by Richard Kilmer, San Antonio, Texas End of The Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume